Hey everybody, welcome. We've got Mark Shepard with us again tonight for week 15. And he had another one of those experiences, he'll talk about it, where shoot, even three or four hours ago, shoot, even an hour ago, we weren't sure he was going to make it. And we had a backup plan in place, but here he is, he's with us. And he'll talk about why he wasn't potentially going to make it. Um, I just have a couple of announcements. One, um, we are just about we're a little over 1,300 members now. We're going to hit 1,500 before the end of the month. Um, that doesn't affect you guys because you're members, and you're going to be members for life for free as long as you stay active. And what does that mean, stay active? It just means you show up like this. Not every week. We know everybody can't come every week. We have four of these sessions a week. Next week, we're going to start with number five. You're not going to make all of those. But you come and look at replays. You become active on the team. <clears throat> Don't show up for six months. We're going to assume you're not active and you're not really interested. Um, but we're going to start charging starting early in October, probably. We'll, we'll give a really good announcement period. We'll advertise and say, you know what? If you want to get in for free, you better still do it. So I would recommend you tell your friends about that, that it's going to be free for just not too much longer, and then we're going to charge. But here's one other thing. As soon as we start charging, you can make affiliate fees. So you can generate a profit for yourself if you refer others. So I'll keep that in mind. Secondly, we just started the editing today. This whole course, I want you to think about something throughout when Mark's talking today. If you would have to pay for this, if you're a regular, and I don't want you to put a number in if you just came to tonight, but there's a number of you on here um, that are regulars. You've been to a lot of these. And if you had to pay for it, what would you think is a fair price? We're going to make this into at least one course, and maybe several. And Mark's only, he says he's got maybe 30 sessions in Forest Ecology here, so we might have another 15. So we're not nearly done, but we're going to break it apart. We're going to make it into like 10-minute bite-sized sections and in, in individual videos, and we'll have lots of them, obviously. And we're going to have a, a, a preliminary sort of a beginner course and then a more advanced one. And those we're going to market. And, outside of the team because you guys get it for free, but you can also make affiliate fees on those. So if you wouldn't mind, just think about while we're talking at the end of the day, I'll just ask you real quick to just throw it up on the chat what you think that you would pay. We did this for mine on Monday nights for aquaculture, and I'm not going to tell you the numbers right now, I'll tell you later, but we got a whole bunch of people that put in what they thought the right number should be. So, good time, Mark just came back. I am confused with anything introductory. Again, throw your questions in whenever you have them. We'll I'll ask Mark to answer them as it's sort of appropriate with what he's talking about. And he has got a real surprise for you tonight. It's all yours, my friend. Hey there. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, as you know, we've been uh, doing a uh, progressive course in forest ecology covering the whole entire curriculum, which, of course, includes basically anything and everything that has to do with all of the life and all of the uh, non-life of a system that may or may not include woody plants in it, the, the, the growth and development and so on. We've been talking about disturbance for the past few weeks, and the uh, uh, past two weeks at least have been fire adaptation among woody plants. Uh, and then someone asked me last week about how long I actually observed my site before actually doing anything to it, and I said, well, 300 years. And I explained briefly what it was that I did and how I observed to see that. Uh, so then this week I had a PowerPoint all lined up and ready to go on uh, fire adaptations uh, and then how to read different um, landscape components, etc. So that was my whole focus was how to walk onto a piece of property, look at it, and in you know, a little bit more than a split second, no 1,000-year, 2,000, 5,000-year history of that site. Temperature, weather, rainfall patterns, on and on and on. Disturbance patterns, if it likes fire, if it gets flooded. So that was going to be my focus this week. And then last night around 6 or 7 o'clock, it started to rain. Now, last week we had uh, three and a half inches of rain. The previous week we had five and a half inches of rain in one night. And then it was like an inch, and then a point ten, and then an inch. Uh, and well, last night, overnight, uh, it rained and it rained and it rained and it rained. We had eight, eight inches of rain last night, actually more than eight inches of rain uh, because that's all my rain gauge does. It was overflowing this morning. Dumped it out. <clears throat> well, my wife had to go to town. Uh, her car was in the shop, so I had to get her to a friend's house to get her, uh, to get her car. We left way too early in the morning. Uh, 
What happens when it rains that much, when we have saturated soil, we have a huge river down the middle of our valley. Um, and so we had, uh, we tried to get the car off the farm. We couldn't. We had to circle back around in the pouring rain, wade waist deep through a raging river, uh, get in my four-wheel drive vehicle, and I drove her to town. But I couldn't just hop on the road and go to town because roads were out everywhere. Uh, so I basically spent the day um, filming what happened in my... And, uh, Turn your phone off. <laughs> what happened in my region and the difference between other farms and my farm? And uh, we'll see a lot of uh, a lot of things that's going on. Is this right here the, the view that we see? So what I did is I this is not on a PowerPoint presentation at all. These are just raw photos that I took today. Didn't have time to organize them, so I'm just going to ram through these things. Tonight's session may go a little bit long. Uh, ride with me. Um, this is significant and important because I'm going to spin it back around to the context of observing your landscape. We can look at a landscape and we can tell by the shapes of the land, the shapes of these hills, tell us something about the rainfall history, the shapes of the valleys, tell us a lot about uh, where the water floods, where it goes, how deep the water goes, and so on. Then more subtle clues will give us more micro-site uh, clues on how to read our landscape. So this is a lot of uh, observing the landscape for disturbance regime. <clears throat> now, anywhere you go, you're going to want to be able to manage the water resource on your farm. Water is the number one important nutrient. Doesn't matter, NPK, sulfur, these things can all be in deficiencies or overload. If you don't have water, we don't have plants. We don't have plants. We don't have animals. Uh, we don't live on pure uh, pavement. So what I did is we drove, my wife and I drove to town, uh, and when we did, it was uh, 4 o'clock in the morning when we left because <laughs> we finally got off the farm, uh, and then as I was coming back, it finally got light enough to take these photos. And this is the, the highway between uh, Viola, which is behind me. My farm is up this valley to the right. We're up on the ridge. Uh, Mastodon Valley Farm starts here and goes up the valley this way. Peter uh, and Mo Allen live up there. Uh, so we had water over the road, driving really slow. Where did this water come from? Is it only the water that fell from the sky? No. In any landscape, the water that you see in the valley came from the uplands. So 90% of all of the uh, flash floods that we see uh, around the country are because the water up in the headlands this, this is just a forested slope. So the, the uplands above it, there's agricultural fields up on top. That water has not been managed. And so it all flows down into the valleys. And as the valleys join together, the little streams turn into big streams and so on until eventually floods roads. And, and this is part of the thing that like blows my mind. Right here is where a stream goes by, right? If it's really big and flat next to a stream, this really big and flat area is called a flood plain. Now, a flood may actually be an act of God, but you know what? It's going to flood. And if you look at the banks on the side, you'll see these historic high water marks. You say, well, that's the thousand-year flood. Well, you know what? It's going to flood. I don't care if it's going to do it once every thousand years. If it happens tomorrow and it's a thousand-year flood and you build your house here, you're fairly well in trouble. So read the landscape and, and don't do things down here that, that are going to get washed away. Don't build your house here. Don't plant your soybeans here. This soybean field is toast. It's gone. Uh, how about put some perennials here that belong here? How about some lowlands um, dwelling uh, woody crops that love to be inundated periodically, like pecan or walnut? Uh, so, oh, what all right, here we go. So now we're going to drive up here and around the corner. Out here is one of the most beautiful uh, uh, grazed pastures that I know of anywhere. Oh, it skips too, Wayne. It's not right there. So typically there's this beautiful meandering trout stream. It's a, it's a world-class trout stream. When uh, my wife and I went by here at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you can see evidence of it. Can you see where the water was at 4 a.m.? Well, I can. See this line along here where the vegetation has been mashed down? It's all the way mashed down. This little banking got carved over here, and it went all the way across here at 4 o'clock in the morning. Only an hour before I took this photo, this was, this was almost a solid lake, a sheet of water moving through this valley. There, there is a cow there uh, laying on its back with its feet in the air. Half the herd was on this side and half the herd was on this side looking at the water going, duh, what happened? If you stand here and you turn around, 
This is facing uh, west. If we turn around and face east, uh, this is upstream. This is the creek that comes off of my farm. This is Camp Creek. Uh, this whole entire valley, you can see how the vegetation has been mashed down and matted and moved in our direction. Then it all dammed up behind this road, and then you see the vegetation bent this way. It all shifted and flowed this way before going under the bridge. This bridge did not uh, wash out. Uh, here's more evidence, this mashed down vegetation. You can see uh, oftentimes, and you'll see in these pictures, you'll see debris that had been washed downstream that will be at marking the high water mark. So you can go someplace uh, in the fall, for example, and you look around and say, oh, yeah, wow, there's been a heck of a flood here within the past year or two because sometimes that stuff hanging up high in the brush, it, it gets dried out and it doesn't decay. So you'll see the high water mark with you know, tufts of debris hanging up in the trees, and you'll know where the flood was. Simple observation. This is what you know, happens to parts of the road. Uh, so we're basically driving up to my farm. We go through this uh, crack in the rocks here. We're in bluff country. It's, it's canyon land more than hills and valleys. So flat table land on top, flat valleys in the bottom, steep hillsides in between. So as we go up here, can you see the evidence here of where the water had flowed across the road? At one point in time, the water came through here and was completely across the road that way and completely across the road, and we see the vegetation line and see how the sand pile has been carved all the way across here. So that's, that's about 56 feet going across the highway, another 56, so 150 feet wide, raging river carved out the side of the road. Uh, this is skipping too fast. Well, so now what we've done is we've taken a right to turn up to my farm. This is a neighboring cornfield. Look what happens in annual cropland. In annual cropland, when the rain hits the bare soil, the, the soil particles get mixed with the rain, it settles out, uh, the finest particles stay in suspension in the water. The finest particles are clay particles. The coarser material settles out uh, and then it all washes away. So all of the soil is moving. There's this fine particles of soil washing away with this. As more and more water accumulates in the, in the valley, the stream gets uh, larger and larger, faster, and then it picks up more and more heavier material and then much of the erosion is caused by scouring from debris, from rocks and pebbles and gravel that are being carried with it. You can see how it roared all the way through this, this uh, um, field here, and it spread all the way across. And I don't know why this little uh, center part was raised a little bit. It had gone around this way, and it came around this way. And then it got to um, the bottom of the hill. And what's really interesting about this, this is just a generic picture to you guys. You know, who gives a rip, right? Well. If we went back here, this water right here whoosh, shoots across the road right here. So this is all coming from that cornfield. This is how wide that stream was. This little piece right here came from the ditch on the side of the road. So this came from an annual crop field cornfield. This came from a ditch on the side of the road. Now look at this place over here that's all these trees and whatnot. Well, that happens to be New Forest Farm. And uh, this happens to be a valley coming from New Forest Farm. All of New Forest Farm is patterned based on the key line system, but modified. And it has uh, terraces uh, or swales and berms, if you want to call them that, um, channels and mound to catch the water, spread it out, uh, slow it down, soak it in, uh, hold a bunch in a bunch of ponds. And look, there's nothing, there's nothing coming out of this valley. This is 20 acres worth of land. It got the same amount of, land of water as this stuff did. Uh, it was eight inches last night, two and a half during the day. Uh, it's still raining right now. They're expecting another three to five inches um, the rest of tonight. So this is uh, our croquet club, where we play croquet on Friday nights, the Kickapoo Valley Croquet Club, and gravel pit. And once again, look at this. No water coming off the farm. No water coming off the farm. Why doesn't New Forest Farm shed water like these other uh, annual crop farms do? Uh, Here's the road. This is uh, looking up the road now. This is coming from the cornfield, all the debris that's washed across. Uh, all of our fences on the downhill side were washed out from the neighbor's water. Uh, I still have two pigs missing. There's not a single cow on the farm right now. Uh, but look at this. This, you know, this is lush. This is green. There's no problems over here. This is primarily uh, on this section right over here. This is maple, uh, you know, sugar maple that we planted, hybrid poplar for timber. Uh, Korean pine for pine nuts and chestnuts and hazels. 
And so then we turn around looking back down the road and we see how this is where the road ditch carved and went left on the uh, croquet court and this is where the cornfield bled this way. Um, this now is New Forest Farm. This is a radically different scene than something like this or the cornfield with water running down it. And I'm going to briefly cut out to a PowerPoint and I'm going to fly through this because I have, do not have time to uh, go through an entire water management uh, system. Uh, what Jeffrey or Wayne can do, we'll, we'll find my schedule for this fall. I'm about to go into my big teaching and install, um, doing a lot of design and install projects this fall. We will be doing some course on the water management system, which is an adaptation of the key line design system uh, that we're calling the master line system uh, for very specific reasons. This farm that you see was designed according to the master line system because the simple key line geometry did not work on this landform. This landform is too complex uh, to, to follow, to dogmatically follow the, uh, the true key line methodology. Uh, why didn't that slide advance? Uh, we'll do it this way. Come on. All right, Wayne. Oh, there we go. Of course, I got my inspiration from tree drops, permaculture. It was in the permaculture designer's manual that I saw these pictures and it really caught my attention way before we ever bought, bought the farm. That if we do just change our cultivation pattern, start up here, uphill in the uh, watershed, and just kind of steer slightly downhill going toward the ridge, we can actually take water from the valley and move it to the ridge. That's, that is a real trip, and it twists people's mind around. They say, you can't make water go uphill. Well, we're not making it go uphill. We're starting high in the watershed down in the valley, and then we're going to move slightly downhill as we go across the face of that ridge. So, yes, we go to the top of the ridge, but this is a downhill direction. Uh, and I, I looked at these patterns. I said, that's, that's brilliant. I've got I've to do that on my land when I get my land. And then I also saw this in the permaculture designer's manual based on the key line design system. And what I noticed here is if you look at this, these lines with arrows, look at this line right here where this water, it, this is a contour, all these lines are at the same elevation. It starts at this, that line, it goes down, slope, downhill, 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 and it fills a pond. Well, then it overflows, it goes downhill, 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 and it fills another pond. Downhill, downhill, downhill. So what we just did is we took water that was going to go down this valley, and we now put it over in this valley, and we went across one, two, three different ridges. Like, holy crap, that's miraculous. This line right here is what we're calling the master line. Because if you put in one line that changes the whole total hydrology of your system and the water pattern, that is the master line. Uh, it's the key to this whole system of how the water is going to move, but I can't call it a key line because Darren Doherty is going to get snotty. And it's not officially a key line. That's the master line that, that changes the, the hydrology, and it doesn't have to be only in this pattern. You can move that water wherever you want. You can move it here. You, know, you can take it from here and move it there. How you change the water on your property uh, is up to you. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? What are the crops you're trying to grow? What's the livestock you're trying to manage? Are you in a low rainfall area, high rainfall area? Do you need to concentrate water if you're like in Nevada? Or do you need to spread water out if you're in, in Vermont, uh, for example? Or quite the opposite. What if you're in the Netherlands? You need to get that water away from your property. Now we're talking ditches and drainage instead of rehydration of the landscape. I can't believe there's, there's people who actually live below sea level and then they get it in their mind to go buy another piece of real estate. So they go, go to another country and buy another piece of property below sea level. That's, that's ridiculous, but you know, everybody's different. This, is, this was a system that if you look at this landform up top, the water that lands here could be like one inch of rain falls everywhere, right? So everything gets one inch of rain. Well, it's not all that case. Because what happens is some of it doesn't soak in and it starts to flow. And it moves down, and this one inch adds to this one inch, to this one, to this one, to this one. By the time it gets down here, this valley may have gotten like four feet of water because it flowed off the top. This is exactly the case that happened in the photographs I just showed. It'll be the case in the, uh, in the photos I'll show uh, subsequently is that the water up here was not managed. It was allowed to escape, which means that this, that water will never be available here for use again to water crops, trees, animals, 
humans, etc. So if we design a system uh, based on key line or master line or USDA contour farming terraces, uh, we can actually make the water zigzag back and forth across that landscape a zillion times if we want to. When it finally gets to the bottom, now let's have a windmill that pumps it back up to the top and we just use the same water over and over and over again. I've had a goal on my farm for the past 20 years, no water will leave my farm over the surface. It's got to go transpire through a plant, come out in some animal's breath, go out in an animal's body, uh, leave in the form of fruit, uh, alcoholic beverage and cider, uh, or go soak through the ground and come out as a spring or, or a, a stream, not as overland um, flood flow. This is Yeoman's property. This is the book P.A. Yeoman's wrote, Water for Every Farm. Out of I could go to an audience of 3,000 people and ask how many people have read this, and you'll have maybe 1% of the people in that audience have read that. And I say, okay, of those of you who have picked this up and started to read it, how many of you finished? Out of the people who've picked it up, maybe 10% have finished. Out of the 10% that have finished, I ask, okay, how many of you understand this? Maybe 10% understand or claim to understand it. Well, then, okay, if you tend to claim to understand it, how many of you guys have been doing this for the past 20 years and it goes down to one or two people? There's maybe a handful of people on the planet who have been working with this technique, set of techniques, for a career. And what's fascinating about it is we read this book, and theoretically it's written in English. Uh, it's very difficult to read because it's not exactly in, in the kind of English that I learned. Of course, I learned Yank or some kind of stupid language like that. Um, Every one of us who claims to understand this and have worked with this for a period of years all do it differently. Why? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that uh, the land is different everywhere and it doesn't behave exactly in a purest codified way like Yeomans said it did. And uh, in writing my own book on water management, I learned something fascinating. Um, I, I don't know if you guys can see my hand, but if we have uh, a main ridge going across our hand. We have primary ridges and primary valleys. This is a first order stream according to uh, hydrology. A first order stream that meets another first order stream uh, like this <laughs> now becomes a second order stream. Two second order streams that meet become a third order stream. Well, Yeoman says that you only have primary valleys and main valleys. Well, sometimes you'll have this weird anomaly that there's a secondary valley. It's like one sentence in his book says that. What I found out is Australia is the hydrologically simplest continent on the planet. On, on Australia, there is no stream more complex than a third order stream. Like this little primary valley meets this primary valley. These two secondary valleys come together and make a main valley. That's it. Well, I found myself in 1985 walking around my farm with this book, which was very difficult to get back then before the internet, a small, out of print uh, book on agriculture from Australia. It took months for me to find it, finally. I got it, and I'm reading it, and I'm following it to the letter, and the landscape did not behave how this book told me that it would behave. Um, uh, recently, Darren Doherty and this guy, uh, Georgie Pavlov, put out a... Uh, a uh, booklet on understanding the geometry of key line. And even in Pavlov's book, signed by Darren Doherty, he's got like one or two sentences. I said, oh yeah, every once in a while you run into this little thing called a landscape anomaly. Well, you know what? I found myself in the upper headwaters of the Mississippi River, which is the most complex river system on the planet. It's a 14th order stream. It's so convoluted and so complex that Key line design barely covers it at all. Uh, in very specific, very simple circumstances, if you follow the key line cultivation pattern, it'll work. Um, so f most of the cases I've ever ever used, um, uh, attempted to apply key line geometry to a landscape, you know, the patterning, um, I find that the land doesn't doesn't uh, work, and so I adjust. Twice in 20 years, I've found uh, landscapes with a farm laid out perfectly, so it's a super easy way to start. I still start according to uh, you know, finding a key point and setting a key line, which is a, a contour line from that key point. This is Yeoman's own farm, same amount of rain as uh, uh, Reno, Nevada, and uh, 
was purchased as rubbish land. There's a lot of cool YouTube videos uh, on, on this place, all black and white videos when he first got started. It's like broken shale, horrible stuff. You'd hardly call it soil. It was purchased um, in the uh, 1950s, and it was sold back in 2007 for, for 52,000 an acre for development. And the thing was is that site held enough water in place for uh, 1,200 households already. No reservoirs needed. And it was done as part of the profitable development of this property uh, as an agricultural property. Yeomans also wrote a book on designing water from the cities and I was talking with my farm crew today. It's like, think about how stupid the human race is in that all of our cities, even like in Tucson, Arizona, for example, our cities are designed, our, our landscapes are designed, our, our rural areas are designed to take the water and channel it and make it go away as quickly as possible as if it's some kind of nuisance. We've got gutters on our roof to get it to a pipe, to get it to a, a gutter on the side of the road, to get it to a storm sewer, to put it in a concrete channel and get it the hell out of here. Think about Los Angeles, California, when it rains an inch. They've got great points. Turn that off. Raging torrents going down uh, these concrete channels, so they have hundreds of millions of gallons of fresh water flowing out to sea. And then they have water shortages. They have to pipe water in from Colorado. It's insanity. We need to redesign our agricultural land, our suburban land, our, our uh, urban land, etc. One of the things that really caught my attention with the Yeoman's book, Water for Every Farm, was that our goal is to, to create topsoil. And being a kid who learned composting from my dad, a biodynamic gardener, I learned it takes eons, geological eons, to create soil because you have to keep making this compost, you rot the stuff and you throw the compost on the surface, you got a couple of little crumbs, it's going to take a million years to build topsoil. But what, what uh, Yeomans claimed is that what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to develop deep biologically fertile soil, um, we're going to take the subsoil and turn that into topsoil. And I said, I'm, I, I'm going to give this a try. It, it's, it sounds like this guy's hallucinating, um, but I'm going to give that a try because what if he's right? So what we're going to do, look up top here, we're going to convert the subsoil into topsoil. We need roots in the ground, we need airspace, we need water, and we need decomposition. When we get all those things, roots are basically carbon that the plant just pumped down into the soil. And if those roots either die or they exude sugars into the soil, all those are carbon compounds that are now in the soil. They decay and they turn black. You can turn the subsoil into topsoil. Uh, this is my farm probably eight years ago. And a report came out. <clears throat> Some university did research with Darren Doherty and Ed Collins and, and said that, guess what? You know, key line design does not work. You do not improve the soil using key line design at all. See, NPK before key line, NPK after key line, no difference, does not work. I had just recently got, so this was seven years ago, a new wind turbine, and I climbed up the tower. I only dared to go up 80 out of the 100 feet because it was moving back and forth. And I was bummed out. It's like, well, I know it makes rich, fertile soil. I know it does because I used to have really red, sticky clay soil. And you look at all the soil on my neighbor's farm, all this red, sticky clay. And then you look at the, the farm road, all this red, sticky clay. And it's like, well, wait a minute. How is it that this field here with swales and berms and the water spreads out instead of concentrating in the valley, the water spreads out. I'm using extensive cover crops uh, and plow downs and subsoiling, uh, sometimes with a, with a yeoman's plow, this soil, by actively farming it, has turned into topsoil. This soil, by not using it at all, stays as the red clay. It's like, wow, there's a picture right there that we have turned red clay into topsoil in, in this case, probably 12, 13 years, so 7 minus 21, so yeah. And this is, this is a sample that a USDA uh, a uh, guy from Connecticut came and dug. Uh, we did cores, and in the ag land over here, we had about eight inches of topsoil that we created. In the road here, we basically have a little crumb of organic matter on a, a O horizon. Well, this is the master line swale on my farm here. This is what sets the water management pattern for the whole entire farm. It's patterned off of this line. It's the master. Just below here, where we've been uh, grazing, so it's got water management, lots of extra soapage. It's had deep time uh, ripping with a subsoiler uh, and grazing perennial pasture. This was uh, 30 inches deep of topsoil where it was formerly red clay. This really happened to me. Now, I don't care if the NPK in this is no better than the NPK in that. 
I would much rather farm in this black stuff than in this red stuff over here because this stuff you can't even scrape it off your boots. So this is what is, is in part because of managing our water resource. We have way more water available to our plants in this system over here. Uh, one, because of the berms and swales and subsoiling, and two, just because of the increase in organic matter. A 1% increase in soil organic matter will store an extra two swimming pools per acre. Uh, so think about now here in New Forest Farm, Southwest Wisconsin, uh, we just got, you know, almost a foot of rain, a uh, third of a meter overnight. Uh, we can store two, three, four, five, seven times the amount of water that we could have. We can store so much more water here than we could in there. I wrote about it in a book. In this book, I punted when it came to the water management chapter simply because there's so much that needs to be addressed that I could not do it in one chapter. So my follow-up uh, book to this is on water management. And because it is so complex and so uh, fascinating to me, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more complex. I'll get to it. I really will, I promise. So back to the simple key line. What you do is if you're looking at a map, uh, you'll have wide uh, contours, then all of a sudden they get narrower. Right where they get narrower, that means it's from like a valley form to like the head wall of the valley. So this is kind of shallow going up, shallow. Now it's getting steeper. So it's right here. It corresponds to the web in your fingers, if you can see me on my webcam. So from the key line, uh, or the key point, you make a contour line. So it goes out, and just before it starts turning around the corner that way, you stop. And you go out this way, and just before it starts going around, you stop. That's the key line. And then the next slide will show, it flips the picture around, it will show that when you go ahead and now till your fields parallel to this key line downward, uh, what will end up happening is the water will naturally flow from the valley toward the ridge. And that is a true miracle that Yeoman's discovered. That's the, the miracle of key line geometry. Well, then what you do is you go to the lowest practical ridge on your farm, and you just make a contour along this low ridge. Now you go parallel up to the ridge, this ridge reference contour here, and what will end up happening is all your patterns will now seek to, they'll now cause the water to flow from the valleys to the ridges. That's a bloody miracle. And I've actually worked with two properties where it actually worked. Because in my part of the world and any other parts of the world that I've been to, the landforms are more complex than this. This just shows that in the valley, parallel down, even if you're just changing your tillage pattern, it will make the water flow from the valley toward the ridge. If you till from the ridge up, it will make the water flow from here out towards the ridge, and that's brilliant. We now water the ridges. The ridges are usually the driest, stoniest parts of, of your property, and now they're going to get uh, more water. Well, as you move up the ridge, uh, what will happen is now these curves get so tight that you can't really move your equipment here. So you just kind of pull back until it's smooth again. You do it smooth until it gets too tight, and then you pull back and you do this and keep repeating this up the ridge. Neither Yeomans nor Mollison addressed what to do in these little things right here. Now, if you look at your fingernails, and you see underneath your fingernail that little half moon thing right there, that kind of corresponds to that. Uh, what I've ended up doing with, with the master line system is instead of hoping that the landscape falls into this regular pattern, we'll go to the key point lay out a key line, we'll do a couple of parallels down and see if it actually works, if it actually does, uh, if these lines do actually go downhill from the valley toward the ridge, we'll stick with that because key line works. Uh, but most of the case, it doesn't. So what I'll do is I'll, my first parallel, I automatically pitch it downhill at about a 1% slope. And we'll get into the details of why later. And what ended up happening is that corrects 90% of the problems, and you'll make one single line, you don't have to two, have two separate cultivation patterns. It'll start at the key point and go down towards the ridge. Start at the key point, go down towards the ridge. We just preset it and say, you will work. Well, then we go parallel down and parallel down, then parallel up. As soon as the geometry doesn't work, we stop and we reset it. And what we end up having is we end up having these shapes on the ridge, just like with the, with the key line uh, pattern. And then what we also have is we'll have uh, shapes like that in the valleys. And so oftentimes we'll couple the valleys. We'll make a little pond in the valley. 
and then a little pond out on the ridge. So the valley pond will fill and flood, and we'll send it out here, and we'll put it out to a ridge, a shallow ridge pond with a, a level sill at the end here, so now the water sheets off the ridge. Um, one of the things is, where's the key point in this landscape? Well, this could be one of them, and so could that one, and so could that one, and so could that one. These are all kind of technically maybe possibly uh, key points if you look at a contour map. If you run a key line off of any one of those, a contour off of any one of those, the geometry does not work. Um, so that's where I started. This is New Forest Farm uh, 20 years ago. No, not 20 years ago because my building's there. Never mind. That was only maybe 10 years ago. So every, every property has a sweet spot. Uh, I've gotten in a lot of trouble for saying that, but every property does have a sweet spot. There is a master line on that property. And Yeoman's even said it here, I think this is page 139, a principal consideration is that we, the final result should be two or more interconnected storages, ponds, in which the overflow from the highest dam is cut by the water collecting channel and directed to the next lower dam and so on throughout the entire chain of dams. So what you've got is you've got the whole entire uh, water management strategy on the farm is unified by this one master line. Yeoman said so right here. Well, then what he said, you know what, guess what? And this is where he goes through all this trouble about talking about what key line geometry is. And then he says, if on occasion it doesn't work, <laughs> wing it, adjust it, up or down by a few meters or feet or so. So wait a minute, why did he go through all these pages trying to describe to us the importance of key line geometry and then with one sentence says, wing it. So what I've done is I've figured out a very simple systematized method of winging it that works and what it does is it will follow key line geometry mostly and more significantly for us in the US not so elsewhere it complies with uh, USDA uh, agricultural codes rules and regulations this right here uh, is you know has a blessing it's a key line design system Bill Mollison's in his book this is a master line right here that's the master line of this system right here change the whole hydrology and then you pattern off of that line the rest of the landscape and if it does if the rest of the landscape doesn't comply with key line geometry adjust it that's the whole point USDA code 330 contour farming listen to this we're going to use ridges and furrows what ridges and furrows huh that sounds to me like a, a swale and a berm uh, caused by tillage and other operations to change the direction of the water. Instead of going down the slope, we're going to go around the hill slope. So the USDA is telling us to do this. Uh, we want to do it to you know, reduce erosion, reduce transport of sediment, etc., etc., increase water infiltration. This is how you find it down the bottom. Uh, American farmers, we have to obey this code. It tells us the margins of error within which we have to work. Piece of cake. Then we use terraces and earth embankment or a combination ridge and channel. Hello, can you say swale and berm? I've gotten a lot of heat for using the term swale. I'll use them almost everywhere that it's appropriate. They may not be appropriate everywhere. What is your context? What are the goals that you're trying to accomplish? If you're in the USA, guess what? It's best management practices. We're going to reduce erosion, sediment content, runoff, anywhere where these issues are going on. These are useful and helpful. We need to use instruments. Uh, laser levels uh, are the most accurate on the ground. Yes, you can get a GPS that's as accurate as a, as a laser level for $25,000, $30,000. You can get one of these or a handful of friend of these, get these for like four or five hundred bucks at a, at a Home Depot um, that last a good long time. And what you look at, the reason why we need these, see these orange flags going right through here? And, uh, are they going downhill, uphill, or are they perfectly on contour? And I'm only taking three answers. Those are actually going downhill at a 1% uh, slope. From here to here is a one foot drop over 100 feet, one foot drop over 100 feet, one foot drop. But it looks like it's going uphill. The reason why this optical illusion happens is we see a slope going this way. We see a slope going this way. We see a field edge going this way. We may see fences and roads. And our mind brain kind of figures out a way for us to be able to walk across this landscape as we're bobbing up and down and our eyes are wiggling in our head so we don't get dizzy and fall over. Our, our, our organism is good enough at doing that. We are not good enough to make a slope at 1% or at 
um, unless we get really, 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 really well trained at it, and then we follow up and verify with this. All of this, uh, you know, is on other uh, webinars that I do. This will be more on the, on the water management stuff, but I just want to mention that we want it designed to be able to handle our catastrophic rain event. If we don't design for a mega event and we get a mega event, we can have a catastrophic failure. We don't want that. You got clay soils, you can have a swale deeper, steeper sides, sandy soils need to be wider so they don't fill in so quick. And then we need to measure the water infiltration rate, understand the infiltration rate because our capacity of our ponds and our outlet and all the swales plus infiltration has to be able to intercept the, the, the water falling on that catchment area, whatever the area is where the rain is falling on. Then you have to add any inflow from off the farm. Follow the USDA rule book. It's all in there. I don't have to go over it tonight. And then we modify what's in there within their tolerances in order to accomplish our objectives. If you've got a slope like this that's perfectly on contour, but we want the water to go to, to my right, we just tip it uh, 1%. We're still within our 2% margin of error, and we just measured it with a laser level. Well, we could also tip it 1% that way. We're still in our margin of error, but what's the result on the land? The result on the land is radically different because all the water now goes that way, or all the water goes this way, or it's perfectly level and it shoots across. All within tolerances, three different radically different objectives. And actually, one of the things about key line geometry, if you go to a key point, key line parallel down, uh, key line uh, reference, ridge reference parallel up, um, you basically have nine different possibilities from here, you know, using this as a key point, this is a ridge, and this is a ridge. Whereas if you modify that, that, that master line, there are, there are 739 different possible geometric combinations just by adjusting 1% of any leg on any line. And I'll go into that at another webinar. I just wanted to show you some stuff. Now, we're going to reference this photograph a lot because um, look at this pattern here. Uh, what happens here is this ditch on the side of the road used to fly right by the farm and it would uh, enter right about, uh, right about here. This 40 acres here uh, all flows through here. It hits the ditch on the opposite side of the road, flows over, hits a culvert, and comes in over here. So we have uh, all of this field here that's now ditched onto the road that goes this way. So there's 40 acres and 40 acres all coming in through this ditch. Well, then there's another 40 acres over here that comes in through this ditch onto my property. So that's 40, 40, 120 acres of water coming roaring across my property and there's big huge erosion cuts here uh, and here caused by that off farm water. Well then this is a 60 acre field and there's another 20 acre over here so there's 80 acres that now come this way um, and roaring through the center of my farm. So uh, 120 plus 80 is 200 acres. Oh and did I mention this 80 that comes down this way? So 280 acres of water comes pouring onto this property and before we did any uh, water management, it would just roar down these valleys and go right down this way, and it's a flash flood like, like we'll be seeing in the, uh, in the other photos. But we'll stay on this. Um, we'll, we'll come back to this afterwards and go back to these photos. So where this picture is right here, this is standing in this little clearing looking down this valley. Uh, we have just had 10 inches of rain. There was, there was water hemorrhaging off of these farms and roaring down the valley here, roaring down the valley here and going through this way. I've never bothered to intercept that flow because it's 120 acres of land. That's a significant uh, constructed thing that I'd have to do in order to manage that water. And it makes a raging torrent. And the same with this 100 acres. I've never bothered to manage that because uh, it it's, was too big for my confidence. I'm more confident now, and as soon as I get the money for the dozer, I'll do it. So this water is not coming from my farm. It's coming from off the farm. This valley is from my farm. Where's the water? Uh, this is a culvert that goes onto the road, and all goes down this way. So we're now walking east along the road. You see this other ditch comes roaring down. There is a, a pond here that I excavated, and it still flows over. Why isn't there water running off of my farm? Because of all the berms and swales. This is looking up that road, that half a mile up the road. The ditch used to come right by here, put a driveway in the, in the way, 
and they wanted to give me a culvert so I could send it right through on the ditch. I said, no, 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 I want to steer it onto my farm. I want this additional 100 acres of, of water. So in our area, if, if we get uh, three feet of rain on 100 acres, uh, I now have uh, 300 extra acres of water that I can draw from. Uh, so I now have a, essentially nine feet of rain of, of rain that I can work with, I pull onto my farm. This is the only one that I really manage at all. So it comes around that corner, settles at this pond, goes underneath the road, some puddle, or the driveway, some puddles on the driveway, and goes into another pond here. And then, <laughs> we went down the road. We, we decided to get off the ridge. This is what happens on the neighbor's farms. It's four feet deep. There's a, there was a, a four-foot culvert here uh, as wide as the road that moved downstream uh, about a, a, a quarter of a mile. This is So we took a left because we couldn't cross that part of the road. I'm just trying to get off the ridge here. And then we go look at the neighbor's fields and look at all the erosion. Uh, this guy is going to actually probably get extra money from the federal government to help correct his erosion. Uh, it's almost insanity. And Let's see if this video plays. American agriculture at its finest. This is a uh, USDA contour farming. Plowed up ground, nice little rain on a slope. Well, of course, we want to like deal with all of this erosion. So instead of not plowing on steep hillsides, instead of having terraces or swales, uh, or controlling the water in the headlands. Let's put a pond at the bottom where it's totally useless for any irrigation or livestock watering where it would have to be pumped back up. The erosion already happens before you ever catch it in that ridiculous pond. Look at all the scum, the green algae in there uh, from all the nitrates, the extra fertilizer running off of that pond. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Annual agriculture at its best. They do this year after year after year, and all that water runs down the valleys, washes out the roads. So we tried to go up over another ridge and uh, see where my knee is. The ditch on the side of the road eroded up to my knee. So we kind of drive up on this little shelf. I wasn't scared. I'm using my big, huge four-wheel drive. My Volkswagen Jetta is still stranded on the farm right now. I will not be driving it. So then we came to this situation here. This culvert is radically undersized. Well, they didn't design it around, you know, the 100-year the flood. They designed it around this, like, 25-year uh, 25, uh, the 25 year flood because that's statistically most likely to happen. Excuse me, the 100-year flood does happen. If you get two of them in a row, you're hosed because you keep washing the road out. Um, know what they've done? Uh, this afternoon, I was watching the, the front end loaders on this road. They're just filling this in with gravel so the steers water back through the pipe again. They have not corrected anything. The water upstream is not managed, and they will not be able to manage the next big flow that comes through. And guess what? It will happen. But in the landscape, look at some things here. See all this vegetation is, is matted and laid down? This is the high water mark, and it actually got so high that this is the water that went down to the right and carved out the ditch on the right-hand side of the road. Logs. I mean, who's parking logs on the side of the road? Notice the matted grass. This, uh, the highway actually ended up being the river for a point in time, and then the water shifted back on, and it was all the way up here. The edge of this was the river and the water flowing down. You can see more logs in there. Uh, a ditch on the side of the road. How do you like the crack of my windshield? Now we're driving up the road. I want you to pay attention to this. This is now going up the ridge. My farm is up the road that way to Croquet Court on the right. Uh, See where this vegetation is matted across here, and then you see where the vegetation is matted across here. This whole entire road was the river about four feet deep, roaring down five o'clock this morning. This uh, drive, this culvert, this like a six foot culvert, this is almost completely washed out. It didn't completely wash out. This is a, a gravel pit over there. Just amazing volumes of water. All happened you know, overnight, and, and the stream just flows away lightning fast. That's why they call them flash floods. Whenever there were cracks in the road, water would come in, get into the crack in the road, and erode the gravel underneath. And sometimes the, the, the road would collapse into the hole. Other times it would pick up sheets of the pavement and move, float the sheets of the pavement down the road. 
Um, this <laughs> fascinates me because at the croquet court, I planted a hedge of hazelnuts. They're in the middle of the flood flow. These are hazelnut brush. They don't care. Now let's look at some evidence. How deep was this water? Another two feet deep. Uh, another place where the water came across the road. Now this gal is not tall. She's maybe five six, and you can see where this this uh, the debris line is up at about chest high for her, and it comes across this way. And here's where the matted grass is, and it causes this big huge waterfall over the edge of the road. We had a blast today, even though we still have uh, uh, two missing pigs. And all the debris on the road. The road was the river for a while. Now this is what the neighborhood looks like. This is what happens when you don't manage your water. Oh honey, we've got water in the basement. Why don't you start that sump pump? Uh, a little six inch pipe is not going to handle these kind of water flows. We need to design our systems appropriately. If you're going to use a small technique like this, use lots of small techniques up high in the landscape so we prevent the big slug coming down like this in the bottom of the valley. Control it up high, subdivide it up high, um, just more erosion and debris shots. Uh, here's a uh, USDA flood control structure. These were all put in the 60s. I'll run this video for a second so you just listen to what it says. This is a uh, flood control, control structure uh, made back in the 1960s. A number of these are put in place around uh, these counties in southwest Wisconsin. Most of them are close to uh, failure in age. And uh, they're a little bit in inappropriately located in that they're put a little too far down in the landscape. If we had put more smaller structures further upstream, we could catch more of the water before it ever got this catastrophic. Behind this structure, uh, the pond is Increasing in depth because, as you can see, that that uh, the culvert going through that uh, that dam is, is spilling as fast as it possibly can. Over on the right, we'll see the spillway, and up behind the spillway, you can see the uh, the impound of water. This does indeed meter how much water will flow on the downstream side of it, uh, but as this approaches capacity. You know, 60 year old earthen structure. Uh, it's entirely possible that these will blow out. Several of them have blown out in these counties in the past few years. So, this is a classic flood control structure earthen dam with a through pipe and a spillway. So, so, what this flood control structure does is where that pipe is coming out, that's a four foot diameter concrete pipe. That's a steady flow high volume, but it's a steady flow, and so the places downstream won't experience this big pulse of all the slug of water roaring down the valley. So all that water slugs down here, gets caught behind this dam, and then slowly gets metered out that way. However, if we had caught all the water up high, we never would have had this have this impoundment down in the landscape. And if we had all of the properties up top, key line or master line designed, the water would not reach here. You already saw some of the pictures from the farm. There's not any water coming from my property. It's only going through my property if it came from somebody else. Our place does not overflow rain, even in, in 10 inches of rain. So this is the impoundment behind it. There are three houses up here that are completely cut off uh, right now. We tried going in from that side, we tried coming in from this side, and then we tried coming in that side. They're completely cut off in this lake and there was only about, this is a spillway here, uh, if you make a spillway you can make it uh, trapezoidal in shape with longer taper on the wall so as it gets higher instead of the volume getting faster, the velocity getting faster it spreads out and spreads out and spreads out so eventually it will be going across the whole top of the dam thin so you could make the spillway a little bit less catastrophic. Two more feet of water in here and that thing's over top and it's going to flood out. Um, it may be discharging faster than it's gaining right now because you see it's already gone down. You see the, the evidence of the water here. They tried to see how far they can go, but these fence posts go completely underwater further upstream. Then we'd be driving down the road and randomly there'd be this, this gushing water. You see that kind of, shh, oh, pretty waterfall. Um, bridges out, road closed. <laughs> You see my screen where it said, Mark, are you having fun yet? 
So, th so this is somebody's yeah, this is somebody's uh, soybean field getting totally covered with rocks. How are you going to deal with that? Now back to back to reading the landscape and observing the landscape. Now this is a willow tree. If you have a piece of property that has willow trees on it, one of the things you, you can observe and you can know a lot about your landscape just by understanding that, wow, there's willow trees here. There must be enough water to support willows. There will be a temperature range between this and this because um, they won't be able to tolerate it any hot, hotter than this. They can tolerate it very cold, but not any hot, hotter than that. They like lots of water. Uh, they also have a tendency to root from any part of them that touches the ground. And if you go ahead and somehow bend it this way, why did this willow tree get bent? Because there was water from here to here, almost chest deep on me. It went right across here, a raging river, bent this tree over. What will happen next year and years after is these will now shoot straight up. And so you see this long tilted trunk and this, these shoots going up. So you may end up seeing a gigantic tree um, with shoots going up and you say, oh wow, that's a willow tree that's bent like this. That means at some point in time when that tree was little, there was a massive flood that went through here. Don't just go, huh, neat. You say, no, 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 no. This is a place that floods four feet deep, raging river, and will dump rocks all over your field. This is a, a genuine site observation. This is a neighbor of mine. Uh, they just harvested their corn for silage. Their cornfield is now a lake. They were very fortunate they got the corn off. So we decided, trying to, we're trying to get to town. So we're up what behind us. Our farm is behind us. And so we're driving along the roads, just checking out the scene. We can't get to town. There's another road out, another bridge out. Then we got to like the main valley. Oh my gosh. Uh, How's, how's that for a barn? Here's the lane. You see the roads going right in. All of this, 100% of all of this is entirely preventable, and it's preventable uh, with the farmer doing some simple land shaping techniques with equipment they already have, uh, and it helps their farm to be more profitable because it drought proofs them, and it helps prevent this kind of catastrophic flooding. Nice place to put your shed. I wonder if their lawnmower is going to start. So, uh, you know, then you get to this crazy kind of stuff. And what's amazing, you know, this, these rocks just pile up all over the place. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, this erosion has taken place over eons of time. Well, sometimes erosion took place in a matter of hours. A lot of our landscapes are formed by massive uh, disturbance events that are, are this catastrophic and change the character of this place forever. So now you've got a little bit of a look of what the neighborhood looks like around me. Now let's kind of go back to my farm and see what we see there. Um, you don't see this kind of stuff. Here we go. Wait a minute. I thought we were in a place that has all this kind of rain. Why, why doesn't it look like that? Well, this is around my cider mill building. If we go back here again, uh, we're standing right here. This whole building, I've got the arrow around, uh, is ditched around the building. So all of this uh, land here will, will sheet across here and get caught in a swale that brings it around that way. And then it enters into this little pond here. So this, uh, the road water here goes into this pond, it goes through into that pond, and it meets with all this, this water here. So we've got you know, uh, 80 plus 10, so there's 90 acres of water that goes through this system right here and then gets distributed out across here. Back to photographs. So this now flows that way. Instead of going down the valley, show where that is over here, instead of all this water going and leaving my farm, it's now going to go around in that way. I'm going to slow it down, spread it out, soak it in. So it comes around the building, goes this way into the swale that we saw previously, and then it goes that way. What am I looking at? <laughs> oh, just looking at, okay, this is actually the septic mound. It goes around the septic mound because we want to drain the septic mound. We don't want a septic mound to be wet. Uh, there's a little pond here, so the concrete slabs drains down this little pond. So the swale goes around the barn that way, comes around this way, around here, and it catches this stuff adds to this and it continues to go around to that pond. It comes around. So once it gets over here, I think the next picture shows it comes out here, goes through this culvert and collects in this pond. 
this pond is like the distributor for 80 acres of, ro of road water and another 10 acres up front that all come through here. And then this distributes it through a swale system that goes that away. Um, and here, here's where that pond is. It's right in here. And you, just, you can't really see it because I'll I don't, I don't mow in there because it's too steep and deep. I just let the brush grow up. Here's, here's a, a key point pond. This is the point around which I designed the whole entire farm. And I'll go to it over here on this screen. Um, so previously what we looked at is we looked at, here's the building, the water that used to go zip here. Instead of adding this water to this valley, we now take it out, catch it, slow it down, and then it adds this 90 to it, and then it spreads back out to this ridge. And out on this ridge, it sheets across this ridge and it cascades out on this ridge instead of going down the valley. Well, the slide that I was on right now, this point right here is the point around which the whole entire water management system on the farm was designed. This water here goes out uh, around here and it sheets across this ridge. It ties in with this water here, but I've never connected it because uh, I would have to make a large structure to get that water to flow that way. So back to this one. Um, but notice the difference. Where, where's all the swamp water? Where's the raging torrent? We've captured it. We've stored it in a pond. So uh, let's go back to this. Here's the pond. It's going to exit this way in a swale and exit that way in a swale. Well, where's this monster Sepp Holter ditch? Well, you don't really need it. The more you put in the landscape, uh, the closer together they are, the shallower they, they need to be. So this is only like 60 feet and then just a little ditch of two bottom plows, so 14 inches wide, 8 inches deep, and then a mound on the downhill side, and then you can see there's repeated patterns down the, down the slope. There's a pond here, a pond here, a pond. I've, I've walked through three of them to show how the water's moved through the system. So it spreads to the left, spreads to the right, and this water that used to go 600 feet down the valley, a drop 100 feet had all the other water to it, was massively erosive. There's erosion gullies still left over, scars from 20 years ago from when this used to be plowed ground. This now goes out the ridge 1,200 feet and forms a sheet around the corner. It makes the end of this ridge uh, wet. The driest part of the farm is now wet. <clears throat> That's the one going towards the ridge. Here's the second pond down. This uh, when it fills up. I've designed the system as an overflow system. If we build a dam and elevate water above grade, we have to have engineers design it, we have to have a licensed contractor uh, install it, and then we have to register it with the Register of Deeds and maintain it as a licensed registered wetland in perpetuity and get extra insurance on it in case your four-year-old child falls in and drowns. I don't want to do that. It's expensive and it's stupid. Uh, however, I can go and I can dig a hole in the ground to generate some fill to go fill in a low spot somewhere else, uh, and coincidentally, water falls into it. Cool. Well, when this fills up, then it overflows through the swales on either side, and this goes down the ridge that way, this goes down the ridge. You we'll kind of see where this one comes out and around that way. If we, uh, we, we use these for watering, if you're going to be grazing in this alley here, they can water here. You graze in this alley, they water here. So we've got four alleys can water from this point. And the same with this one. They get four alleys that can water from that point. If uh, our ponds lower down run out of water, we can simply siphon. You drop a hose in here, put your thumb over the end of it, walk it down, and drop it in here. You can siphon everything full. You can actually run a siphon this way and run drip irrigation. So it's an amazing gravity feed system. We don't need through pipes. One of the issues with through pipes in a climate like mine when it gets to 40 below Celsius um, is they, they freeze, they crack, they break, uh, and they'll, they'll crack the dam and, and you get leakage along the edge, especially because of the, uh, the freezing and thawing. So then you can see the pond below. It spreads that way and this way. Notice, where's, where's the overflow going down the valley? We, there's not even any evidence of the matted grass going down the valley. We've captured this water and spread it out and soaked it in. Actually, the top... The top pond, this is now the middle one here, the top pond, uh, it all soaked in before it even got to the, uh, to the ridge, to the uh, level sail on the ridge. So here's the third one down, spills that way through a swale, and then it goes this way through a swale, out to the ridge. And there's the third one down below. Now on the third one, uh, I, I don't even notice it in this picture. 
Uh, this one spilled to the left. On the third one, there was a, a low spot where it started to bleed across. And there's the going to the left. Go on, here it is, right over here. And what this was is where I was driving over repeatedly. And um, what happens on slopes is naturally the soil will creep. It just slowly moves downhill over time, especially when you add water to it. And what's happened quite often is, is over the years as these ponds have sat there, everything goes out of adjustment just ever so slightly. And so when there's a big rain event, I go out and check it. I film it and say, okay, I've got to go fix this. So now I know that next time I'm just going to come in, scoop a little dirt here, fill that in, problem solved. And the water will continue to flow out there and there will be no overflow. This is what's happening in the main valley um, uh, where the pipes are coming through across the road. Now look at this. Here is the neighbor's field, flows on my property, makes this river. This was 65 feet across and about 2 feet deep. Here's the water coming off of my fields. Uh, nothing except for the blowout in the bottom. You see that bottom swale. And that bottom pond, that little blowout caused this. We had like a little 100 feet of uh, trickly water coming across. 100 linear feet is maybe 2 feet wide. Um, that right there is the first overland water flow from my system in 21 years. And uh, I'm actually proud of that, is the fact that we have not let this happen. On, on the watershed that we have full management authority over. And hopefully pretty soon we'll get this one, I'll, I'll get the equipment, I'll start doing the work up in the headlands there. <coughs> so this is what that uncontrolled water flow does. Head cuts. Here's another, just another view. No water coming down this valley. We got water coming from that 80 acre field and this 80 acre field. Um, now I'm walking up the ridge. I'm going to quickly go here again. So uh, what I showed you is this valley here was the one with the ponds and the swales that split it out. And it was that lowest pond down here. There's a little bit of a bleed, so there's a little bit of overland flow there. And then coming down from this pipe, and there's a torrent coming down from that pipe that goes through this woods. And this is where the head cutting was, all the erosion. My property, the erosion on my property is caused by their water not being managed on their property and forcing me to manage their water on my property at great expense. So back here, um, now I'm going, oops, I'll go back here just to show you. So then after here, uh, I walked around the corner and then up this ridge. And this ridge is where these uh, swales from those same ponds in this valley come up to the ridge and then they go across this way. Then it comes across this way and then this one goes from here, comes out that way. That's what we're going to do next. So this looks all the way back up at a 1% slope to the, to the lower pond in that valley. Um, this is as it's going out to the ridge. And then starting uh, here, there's a drive, uh, a driver cross or crossing. So it's shallow in, shallow out. It still has the swale and burn, so the water still gets conveyed. And then from this point over, it's on the ridge, and it all sheets in that direction and waters uh, the trees are out on the edge of the ridge. These, these trees are in maybe two inches of soil on rock. They're growing in almost solid rock, but they've got plenty of water because it just keeps sheeting over them uh, year after year. This is the level sill in action. I want to see this water just squish, squish, squish on the ground instead of a, a flow causing head cuts and erosion. It's just a sheet that causes the worms and all the woodchucks and, and uh, ground squirrels to come up for air. This is the second swale that goes up to the second pond. That water would have gone roar. Instead, it comes out here and around the corner. And here's the, uh, the crossing where it's shallow in, drive across. And then it goes out across the ridge. And this is a level sill off to the left. So this just fills up and it weeps through that soil. It's no longer a torrent. The water moves until it gets to this point. It fills us up. It's a long, horizontal, perfectly level puddle uh, this deep. It's, you know, two-thirds of the way up my boot. So that's how deep it is there. And it still has, uh, on this one, it's got another six or eight inches to go before it goes over the berm. So this is just filling up and soaking in. It's not even overflowing yet. Um, that's that same, that's the second, the second swale, different view. Is the top swale that comes from the key point, which actually is a key point in the landscape, and it comes around this way, 
And on that way, this is the one that drops uh, that was really lasered in. Now here's a place where the cow has mucked up the crossing. We drive the tractor over uh, this way and drive over that way. That's where all the drive overs are, the crossings. Um, I want to scoop this out a little bit, clean it up, but the water still was moving. And this is the one that the, the water wasn't even making it out to the level sill. This is all the level area that sheets it across, across the ridge that away. Um, and I stood around here. Oh, maybe you can see it. Watch this. Uh, I don't see it. There was a hole, and it, and it wasn't draining like a bathtub drain. It was bubbling, and the water was going down this hole, making this funny sucking and bubbling sound. Oftentimes we'll have uh, chipmunk holes or woodchuck holes that the water will just come roaring out here and just <laughs> down the bathtub drain. And there, the, the animals are, of course, in these little safety air pockets and all their channels fill up. And so they're getting a deep irrigation of the, uh, of the land under here. So you combine on a ridge. This is the driest, stoniest, rockiest soil on the ridge. And now it's getting the equivalent of, of three times the average rainfall that it usually would get. Uh, we have a perennial ground cover putting the roots down deep, uh, animals making tunnels so that water can infiltrate. Uh, once a year I'll go through and I'll uh, drive the subsoiler uh, in parallel to all these systems so the water can all soak in. All of that extra water, the organic matter, this is now a biological sponge. Look at the lush green that we have up on a stony, uh, dry ridge. Here's a, another ridge. This is, uh, if we look at this prop, this picture right here, this is uh, right at that spot there. So the very top of this hill, this is where my wind turbine stands, uh, instead of the water flowing down this way into that valley or down that way into that valley, it bumps into this swale right here, comes out here, and it puddles here. This uh, today was completely full of water. The, uh, the foxtail grass that is left behind after the rye crop was uh, harvested um, was above it. You couldn't see how much water was in it until you actually stood in it. Um, it's amazing to me that on one of the highest pieces of the parts of the property, one of the highest ridges, I've got maybe a tenth of an acre pond. Look at all that water out here. I could grow wild rice. I want to dig a pond, a bigger pond out there. This is that same, uh, that same spot looking down slope. This is the level sill. So this pond fills all the way over here and this water all the way up to this rim. And it's oozing through this green in the background, which is asparagus. So it's a perennial system chestnuts, asparagus, and grazing, and this was cereal rye and yellow sweet clover. Um, we got a lot of honey from the clover, all with the water management. Uh, where's the plow? Where's the, where's the erosion that we saw in some of those bigger ag fields? We sell wholesale. We're selling wholesale commodities, um, and that's how deep the pond is in many places. I wonder if we'll get some ducks pretty soon. Uh, we did have a minor blowout in one of my roads that goes down uh, to, the, uh, to the house. See this little uh, mini swale that crosses the road. If you're going to have a driveway or a road that is going down slope because you've got to get to where you've got to get to, every once in a while just put this little diagonal cut. Just drag a, a, a two bottom, one bottom plow or use a shovel or something. You just have it go diagonally across. Make it gentle in, gentle out so you can drive across in a Volkswagen Jetta. Uh, but there was so much rain that happened it filled this up and <laughs> sort of rode it to peace. This is the only right here, ladies and gentlemen, that's the only erosion damage on my farm caused by uh, almost a foot of rain overnight. Uh, this is the, the, the main pig paddock right here. Uh, we're keeping the pigs mostly. This is uh, this section right in here, this green section. So this is 80 acres worth of water, one foot deep, comes through the, the fence right here, 10 feet wide, uh, and who knows how deep, roaring through here. Well, I put a curved burn, uh, like this reverse, um, it's the same shape as this, but it's a burn with the swale on the downhill side, because that's where I got the dirt from. And what it does is this narrow channel, 10 feet wide, hits this spreader burn, and it spreads it out till it's 160 feet wide. And so if you do the math on taking the shape of its you know, 10 feet wide and however deep it is, then you spread it out 160 feet wide. It's now, you know, uh, 160 times shallower. So you take this stream channel, boom, it hits this reverse herringbone thing and it spreads it out. Then it comes across in a sheet. So we've slowed down that erosive force, 
dr dramatically reduce the scour. It's uh, at this point when I get with, get the bulldozers, I'm going to put a swale berm system here and pick up this water and start moving it across the hill that way. Pick it up and start moving it across the hill that way. I haven't done that yet. Uh, that's where the stream came through on the neighbor's property. This is the berm. I planted all kinds of willow trees on it. They love the water. Their roots help to hold it together. And on the downhill side is where the pond is here instead of on the uphill side. And then you can see here all the way across the pig paddock this big, huge sheet of water. Um, I uh, had to whistle them in this afternoon when I left. There were still two of them missing uh, downstream. No doubt their fence blew out, so I'm going to leave it blown out, give them an opportunity to come back home on their own. And so then once it goes back down into the woods, the shape of the land concentrates it. And you can see it goes from that. Uh, out here, it's probably 200 feet wide. Uh, just it was the, it was like a lake. The first time I've ever seen this this part was a lake. Four o'clock in the morning, that I couldn't take a picture. Then it narrows up again and starts to roar. Now we've seen some of these pictures a couple weeks ago, because down in here there was a brush gabion that I built. Put all kinds of brush and debris catcher just to filter this, catch a little debris, slow the water down as it's roaring roaring downstream. This brush gabion that's down there is gone, absolutely evaporated. It's you know washed away. Here's another one of my little pocket ponds. It also filled up, had a blowout. This is probably 40 to 50 feet wide, three or four feet deep. Uh, it, it topped off and it eroded most of the grass away here and washed down the streams. See the uh, bent grasses that show the water moving away. It also topped off and washed out over that way. Um, this is in that main valley again, not coming, not coming from there, but coming from here narrows up and roared down through. That little pond that topped over was over in here that came this way. So can you notice, is there, a, is there a difference between this and that barn that we saw underwater? There's a dramatic difference. I've got a little bit of grass missing. I've got a little bit of a ditch missing in the gravel, and I've got all of this water soaking in to water my trees. And I was telling uh, a couple on my farm uh, this summer that uh, I have enough water to last next year. My soil is so hydrated that if we have a total drought next year, I'll make it because it's all stored in. Now, you guys have seen this picture last two weeks ago uh, because this is where I showed you know, some debris de deposition, um, sediment deposition from, from flood flow. That was when we had the mere five and a half inch trivial little rainfall. Uh, look, at the, look at the grass matted down here and then look at the scouring that happened over here. This was probably about six feet deep and only about 20 feet wide, this raging torrent. Anytime you see like the Niagara Falls here, uh, it slowly carves its way, moves its way upstream. This is a crossing where I cross that main valley. Um, and I uh, repeatedly have filled this in. Here I've got the situation, just like the road crew does, by keep filling this in next to the culvert or whatever, they're, they're doing it next to a culvert, I'm not solving the problem. I've got to manage that 120 acres of water upstream or else this problem will never go away. I know how to do it on my property. Why don't I go ahead and, and rent that bulldozer and manage this property? This problem will go away. Flash floods will go away. Uh, New Orleans is underwater. We really can't solve that problem, but we sure can prevent flooding going down the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Missouri River if we manage the water high up in the watershed, catch it, spread it out, slow it down, soak it in, hydrate our landscape, minimize the irrigation we need in the uplands, uh, prevent erosion in the uplands, and oh my goodness, prevent erosion and road damage. Uh, there's two different um, uh, towns along the uh, Kickapoo River. This flows into Camp Creek, which flows in the Kickapoo River. Two different towns that have had to get federal money, and they finally moved their towns out of the, out of the river floodplain. So you guys saw this this exact picture two weeks ago had, had the remains of a, of a brush gabion across here, and there was this nice uh, dark brown silt that had been deposited, and some silt came through. Look at the boulders that were exposed this time. I think I'm going to go look for some arrowheads there. Um, just amazing scouring, fast. You know, it just happened within a matter of hours. These are some, uh, these are some uh, little pocket ponds going up uh, Primary Valley. Uh, in a wooded area, and this is the first time ever that this one's filled up and then overflow. You see the matted grass, and then it went flowed down that way. Continue to go uphill. 
this one filled up, overflowed, and it went out that way. I thought I was being cute because I made it overflow this way, and that one overflows that way, and they zigzag back and forth. And guess what? That's the last one that I have. Now what I want you guys to do is remember some of those earlier slides. Then look at, look at this farm and look at how minimal the flooding damage was. I'm going to blow through some of these pictures. Part of our success is also using a subsoil, a hook. You drag it through the ground. You can get one of these things for 200 bucks online. King Cutter, K-I-N-G-K-U-T-T-E-R. Cuts a slot in the ground. There's very little surface disturbance. Or you can get one of these online, 8500 10000 bucks, then plus shipping freight from Australia. Your choice. As your soil gets richer, so do you, unless you buy one of these. Um, that's all you're doing is going to cut some slots in the ground, let that water infiltrate, soak it in deep, get the root matter growing. That's my yeoman's plow. I actually do have one. Long story, I'll tell that um, <laughs> once upon a time. It's said that you, can, that you need 25 horsepower per shank on a yeoman's plow. Uh, I do it with a 40 horsepower tractor pulling two shanks. The reason why I can get away with that is I've had 20 years of soil development using a single shank subsoil. I've got red clay that's uh, a nice brown topsoil, I can pull a two shank subsoiler with a 15 with a year old 40 horsepower tractor. Um, th this is what all of the fields looked like earlier in the spring. See just how the leaves are just emerging? So then as I get all these rains, it all soaks down there. You really do want to combine planting perennial grasses in with your subsoiler uh, because you need to have those roots injecting themselves into that crack and keeping that soil inflated. If you're just doing this like in an annual crop field and you don't have extensive cover crops or perennial covers in it, you actually there's actually a, a research out there showing that you can cause soil collapse because you're not putting enough organic matter into the soil. The best way to put in organic matter is perennials. Grasses, super dense fibrous roots, uh, tap-rooted plants like daikon, tillage radish, uh, or like what I have is yellow sweet clover, and then of course your, your long-term gain is with your trees. The, just think of the carbon that I've stored on this site. A couple weeks ago I did, uh, go, I did the calculation, what was it, 80,000 tons of carbon I've got stored just in the roots of hybrid poplars on my property alone. This is that pond out on the ridge that I was telling you about. This is where all the water will flow not only on the swale system, but it also flows in these channels when you get a real good rain flowing. Um, you can combine it with a tank for biologicals, a cedar for dropping seeds, uh, and as the years go on and these roots penetrate deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, you'll get more organic matter accumulated. The topsoil gets thicker. This is a, a photo I got from Darren. Ben Falk has also used that. There's my farm. This is the water movement before we ever did any patterning and any terraces. The water would flow down the valleys, concentrate, and, uh, and zip away. And then afterwards, I haven't set this up yet because I don't have the time, but there you have it. I just wanted to show you guys. Uh, we're supposed to talk about fire adaptations. Today was just not a fire day out on the farm. This was an absolute water day. And when you do a water management pattern like this on your farm, this will help to drought proof your farm because all that water is soaking into the soil. It's now part of the biology. The trees have it in every single cell of their body. The roots of the trees and the grasses have it down in, in, in them. The organic matter alone in the soil. Uh, every 1% increase, an extra 27,000, three swimming pools worth of extra, three extra swimming pools worth of water on that one piece of ground right there, just because we've turned the soil from red clay into black topsoil. This is how we long-term drought proof our farm. And when it rains like mad today, we have a little bit of squishy ground. This is where the little bit of erosion was on my road. Uh, and as long as we can manage our inflows from other properties, this one here and that one here, and of course this one here, we have an almost drought-proof farm. And if I manage this water, this water, this water, this water on my farm, I've tripled the amount of rainfall that actually is usable on this property. Now that's how you can get some yields. And that's it for tonight. We've gone way overboard. I thank you for your patience for being here. I still see there are at least a couple of people. So nice. One person left, and that one came in. This is amazing. But everybody, you got an amazing Oh, shoot. My microphone was, uh, was, was muted. I said one person is all that's left, Mark. This was amazing.
we got nice little comments. There's Rock. Put in a one in there if you guys like this. No, not that one, right. yeah, no, Question. It's not that one person is left. It's that the only one person left. <laughs> that's right. No, yeah. no, that's, that's what I meant. Um, yeah. Out of a lot of people that are out there. Um, and, you know, I, I asked that question to start. This is, this is not the right week because this was totally amazing. Every week's been great. But what would, uh, you know, 30 weeks of this kind of education, which is what you're getting, if you had to pay for it, put on here what you, what you think it'd be worth. Um, just throw that in. We'll end with this. Mark, again, outstanding. Thank you for my staff and help. There were three or four people helping. I always appreciate that. 200 bucks, somebody said. There's a, there you go. There's a number. What else? Let's see some others. Put some others in there if you guys got some thoughts. Um, well, think about a weekend workshop that you go to. If I did a weekend workshop, I'd do a, you know, a two or three hour Friday night session all day Saturday and all day Sunday. There's people paying a thousand bucks for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've already done 15 weeks of this. Oh my goodness! And I, I'm just getting warmed up. I tell you that the, the 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 amount of information and knowledge that we have uh, that I've experienced, hands on, uh, on the ground, for real, earning my livelihood doing this, and the science that it's based on. This isn't just like the dogma that you read in a book that it has to be a zone zero, one, two, three, four, and circles around this little spot, and you saw it somewhere in a book. It's like, ah, uh, I've been doing this for for 30 bloody years as my livelihood, and it's based on real live science uh, on the ground for real. Yeah, by the way, that person commented and then said a week. So uh, literally, there is more, and, and lots of folks. I don't want to hold Mark here a lot more tonight. We're going to keep these questions for next week. There's a couple just about, does your house have a foundation, Mark? Somebody asked about rolling dip for the road erosion um, that you were talking about. We were thinking about um, uh, putting that in. Fifteen hundred dollars. Another one said per week. I did that with I did that mark and it worked well. That was about the rolling dip. Um, Thirty weeks of water management and I would pay thousands for it. Thank you guys. Anyway, it's been awesome. I'm glad. It, and you know what, Mark would have. Guess what the story would be if his farms looked like all those others he was showing us. It would be a real pleasant story tonight. So, anyway, thanks, Mark. It's been awesome. Thank you everybody for staying for coming with us. We got lots more good to come tomorrow night. If you want to come here tomorrow afternoon and listen about alternative health, we'll be talking about that. And um, have a great rest of your week, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now. And